After nearly 20 years of war, tens of thousands dead, the Taliban have taken back Afghanistan. Nobody expected the Afghan government to collapse as fast as it did. You have the Afghan troops at 300,000 against something like 75,000 Taliban. It is not inevitable. The strategic balance of power won't shift in their favor. Following a lightning offensive that was met with little resistance, the Taliban retook the capital and announced their Islamic emirate. The Taliban leadership say they have evolved and claim they won't allow the country to harbour terrorists. They say they will now form an inclusive Islamic government. There was in the past some mistakes that we have learned from. Many fear it's a smokescreen for a much more worrying reality. If the Taliban catch us, they will class. Definitely they will class. They have become savvier in deceiving. Just weeks previously, I had exclusive access to Taliban commanders to try to find out if they're serious about change and what is at stake for the future of millions of Afghans. There's no way I can surrender to the Taliban. None. No way. Please welcome Jared Cohen and Yalda Hakim. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Yalda Hakim. I'm a BBC journalist and, and anchor. On August the 15th, the world watched in horror as the Taliban took over Afghanistan and tens of thousands of Afghans fled, trying to get to the airport to escape. What we saw was gut-wrenching images of children being trampled on in stampedes and being killed. We saw mothers passing their babies over barbed wire to American soldiers to get to safety. And we saw Afghans hanging off the side of an aircraft and one by one plunging to their deaths as the aircraft took off. What the world doesn't know is the extraordinary role that Tory played in evacuating Afghan women, prominent Afghan women from Afghanistan. And the person who led that effort is my friend, Jared Cohen, who's also the CEO of Jigsaw. Please welcome Jared. Jared, I, I want to take you back uh, to early August 2021, when I called you and said, Afghanistan is going to fall to the Taliban, and I need to evacuate a handful of Afghan girls and women who are part of my foundation, part of an education scholarship program. And I just want you to tell me and tell the audience what you said. Well, first of all, I, I was on vacation, um, and, um, and you called me up, and, and I, I've known Yalda for a very long time, and um, for those of you who don't know Yalda, she goes to every war zone you can imagine, and she covers some of the most heart-wrenching stories. And so I know the difference between Yalda calling me, saying, here's what I saw, and Yalda calling me, saying, I feel like I just visited hell and made it out, and we have to do something. And, and, and I heard that in your voice, and so you asked, you said, I have these four scholarship um, students that, that I want to evacuate, can you help? And like a good friend, I sort of impulsively said yes. Um, and then we hung up the phone, and I remember I called you back five minutes later because the gravity of it kind of struck me. And again, I heard it in your voice. I said, we, we can't just take four out. We should try to get as, if, if Kabul's really going to fall and the country's going to collapse, let's get, as many, um, uh, uh, let's get as many students out and as many civil society leaders out as possible and, and have as many of them be women and girls as we can. Um, and so you and I just kind of got to work on it, right? We needed, you know, a way to get them. We needed a list of women and girls. We needed a way to get them to the airport through the checkpoints. Once we got them into the airport, we needed to figure out how to get them out of the country. We needed countries that would temporarily take them. We needed visas. We needed COVID waivers. We needed countries that would permanently uh, resettle them. We needed money. And, and you know, Tori is really the first person 
Yalda and I spoke to, and I've never seen, I've known Tori a long time too, I've never seen her rally the way that she did, and we'll get to this later, but she also let me kind of call her four to five times a day over a three month period and just kind of scream and rant in frustration and would then ask me if I was okay. And, I said, until next call. <laughs> I, I mean, it was an incredibly uh, traumatic time. Uh, but, and, and again, for those who don't know Jared, the reason I called Jared is because I felt you were the only person that I knew from my network of people who could figure out how to get a plane into a war zone, who could figure out how to call world leaders, presidents, prime ministers, and ask them for permission to evacuate these people and get those people then safely to the United States. Because, Jared, you, you remember, it was sort of the, the burden of the responsibility finally hit you after I first called and you said yes, because it's not just about getting these people out, but it was then trying to see it through right to the end. It's, a very, it's actually a very easy decision in a, in a human moment to, to say I want to evacuate people out, but and when you're sitting you know, in your apartment or, or house in New York and you make a decision to take somebody's life into your hands and make them all sorts of promises and they live halfway across the world and they, they, they have no other option, you better mean it. And, and, and meaning it means you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not just a that week commitment, it's not just a while it's in the news commitment. I mean, it's kind of a lifelong commitment, right? I mean, because you know, you're taking somebody out of their home and everything that they know and they're making a bet on a total stranger to, to make it okay, and um, you know, the gravity of that hit me very hard, very quickly, and you know, the difference between choosing to evacuate somebody and really owning that decision is, I mean, I, I, I'm CEO of a company, I like, didn't run my company for three months, um, and you know, my family understood, but I like, neglected every responsibility that I had because every minute and every hour there was a different there was a different problem. Um, but when you called me, and as we sort of talked about this, I, I looked at the situation and said, I, I, I know how to do this. And I sort of, it's one of these things where you kind of start doing things before you, you think through them and, you know, and, and, and the long-term ramifications of it. Um, but as we sort of kept going, it became, much, it became more and more meaningful. The gravity of it became more and more extreme, and we just kind of couldn't stop. And once you kept going, that's just kind of the situation you were in. And, and these people left their homes with the clothes on their backs, essentially. I mean, we called them, we told them to get to the Serena Hotel. And, and they closed their doors, not knowing when they would be able to go back home or if. Just talk us through the challenges, because yeah. there wasn't a shortage of challenges. It, it, so, so this was an ad hoc group of basically, initially, me, Yalda, and two other friends that just kind of, we're not an NGO, we're not, we have no experience kind of extracting people from war zones, so we just kind of, winged it, um, and, um, but there were, there were so many problems at every step, so we were, our, our group was the very first group of Afghan citizens evacuated out of the country, and they were the very first Afghans um, uh, into Iraq, uh, where they were resettled, into Albania, where they were resettled, and some into North Macedonia, where they, where they were resettled, and so we were kind of the guinea pig for, for, for everything, so I remember talking to the U.S. State Department, they said there's no way into the airport. I said, I don't know what to tell you. I talked to the foreign minister of Qatar and he told me they have a way to get into the airport. And they said, well, if you get into the airport, let us know how you did it. Um, <laughs> so we, so we, so we, you know, we had this amazing woman named, named Arzo who worked with us who was like robo calling um, this group of Afghans. We got them all to the Serena Hotel. I remember the, Af I remember the Qataris reading me the riot act that if anybody finds out about this, they're calling off the whole thing because word of mouth can spread very quickly. So we put them all on buses and as soon as we put them on buses through like 15 or 16 different Taliban checkpoints, the rumors started coming that like the bus had been boarded, one had been hijacked, all these different things. Anyway, fast forward, we get them into the airport and the, the, the lowest point for me, I don't know if we have the picture of, of all the people underneath the, the airplane wing here. So I, I got sent this picture, we got them into the airport, we had no way to get them out of the airport, it was 90 degree heat and you had all these people literally sleeping for four days underneath the wing of this plane, no water, kids on four days of diapers. And I looked at my kids who are eight, you know, today eight, six, and three, but back then I had one in diapers. I just lost it um, because a decision that we made, I, I was convinced was gonna kill one of these kids. And you know, I've never we, we've never talked about any of this publicly before because it's quite emotional. Um, but eventually we sort of figured out how to get them out and then you got them 
out, and then we couldn't find, you know, a plane would land at an Air Force base, and we couldn't find stairs to get people off the plane. And then in Iraq, you had a sectarian dispute between the president and the foreign minister. So I spent like 12 hours on the phone all day with the president of Iraq with, as flight patterns got canceled, getting them reinstated, as it got caught up in all this politics. And the plane would not have been able to land in Iraq if it didn't land before 3 a.m. And we finally got the stairs, convinced the people to get on the plane, and that, plan, that plane landed in Iraq at 2.57 a.m., um, like just in the nick of time. I, I mean, that is what is, is so amazing about this, because what happened in that period, and, and I remember the one thing you said to me, because I talked to you about four girls and, and their families, and you said, if we're going to get a plane into Afghanistan, we're going to try and fill this with as many people, women, children, as we possibly can. And, and I, I do remember when that bus was leaving the Serena Hotel, heading towards the airport, and you'll remember those images of people outside of, of the airport being crushed to death at times. And these, these young women would call me and say, the Taliban have just jumped on, on the bus, and I'd ring Jared, and Jared would say to me, I can't keep calling the emir of, of, of Qatar to say, listen, the Taliban, you know, we have to sort of figure this out. So once we got them to um, Qatar, Jared, just, just tell me, you, you were on the phone to the Albanian prime minister, you were speaking to the Iraqi um, president, you were speaking to the Qataris. The, 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 the fact is that we had a plane full of people without passports and visas or COVID tests. Yeah, these, I mean, these are real heroes. I mean, the, the, the Iraqi president gave two, got Iraq to give 200 visas with no passports. COVID waivers to 200 uh, mostly young girls studying at the American University um, uh, uh, of Afghanistan. I mean, only a hero does that. And same with, you know, the Prime Minister of Albania. I mean, he, you know, he, he, these people are, are giants in terms of, of, of what they've done morally. And, and I just, you know, part of the reason I do want to tell the story is so the world knows what they, what they did. It's just an incredible embrace of humanity. And they themselves are both, you know, former refugees. And... We managed to get these people to Albania. I believe we, we have some of the images um, of, of uh, the American ambassador to Albania helping. I mean, that's, this is how human it became, right? Where we had the prime minister of Albania on the tarmac. We had Yuri Kim, the ambassador, helping carry children down from, from that plane that we got there. This was in Albania, also at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, actually, the prime minister called me at... Um, around 1:45 in the morning, because he had heard I was having some anxiety, and I remember he he, <laughs> I remember he he sent me this very funny message saying, "I know you're somebody who worries. Don't worry, I'm going to be there on the tarmac meeting them." And and refugees aren't greeted this way in countries. I mean, the dignity of you know you know you know women and girls showing up in a country they've never heard of or been to, you know, with all their belongings left behind, and to have the prime minister and the U.S. ambassador carrying their things for them, helping them down onto the tarmac. Um, you know, in Iraq, being greeted with, you know, flowers and music. It just doesn't, that's not what happens. And there, there's just, there's this collection of friends that we were able to rally. It didn't matter if somebody was a president or prime minister, a mayor or a foreign minister, or whatever. It didn't, didn't matter. You know, everybody was kind of motivated to, to try to see what we could do. And we all saw a way that we could help. We also had a situation where uh, a woman was heavily pregnant and she gave birth just as we were trying to evacuate her. She was a YouTube influencer, actually. Yeah. Um, and, and, and tell me the conversation you had with her when, when we had to figure out sorting out documentation for her baby. So I had heard about this YouTube creator, very famous woman in Afghanistan, 21 years old, and I had heard that somehow she um, had gotten left behind by a group of other um, YouTube creators and that she was eight months pregnant and she had been promised by someone who had made the decision to evacuate and then, you know, sort of disappeared um, that if she sold all her belongings and moved to Mazari Sharif in the north that she would take care of her and she found herself out of money living in, you know, a single room eight months pregnant with like 10 family members. Um, and I had heard about her and I'd asked, you know, someone on our team to get in touch and um, she initially didn't want to be part of our evacuation and I like, begged her to, to come with us. I said, I, I, I promise you, if you do this, you have a lifelong commitment from me. And so we got, we got her, we flew her to, from Mazari Sharif to Kabul. Um, we got the group evacuated to the airport the next day and somebody in the Taliban actually recognized her and sent the entire group back. 
Um, um, within three hours of that group sending back, she gave birth uh, a month early. And I had a new problem because at this point, the Taliban had changed the rules requiring passports. Um, and, um, and so, uh, uh, so we, we needed to get you know, some sort of documentation. So I called her up and I said, you need to give this kid a name. I said, I don't care what it is, but you have to give the kid a name. And then I didn't think about it again. Um, and, um, and she eventually, you know, got, um, they eventually, you know, um, the baby was evacuated. The baby only had to live under the Taliban for three days. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and the baby, we, we called baby, well, they called baby Jared. Yes, the, the baby, the baby's, the ba I, found, I found this out only after, actually it was the prime minister in Albania called to tell me this, that, that um, he, he said, baby Jared Mohammadi has arrived in, in, <laughs> in Tirana. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the things I, I, I really admire about the United States is it's, it's a country that's made up of, of immigrants. And, and what we were able to do is successfully bring those Afghans into the United States and, and really change the lives of not just the current generation, but, but generations to come. Because the situation for Afghan women is, is the worst now in the world. It's 270 days since Afghan girls can't go to school because the Taliban have banned them from school. I mean, Jared, I, I want to know what you would say to your girls, uh, you know, in years to come when they become adults about the fact that these children, these images we're seeing now, you, you've changed their lives. Well, I think a lot of people were responsible for that. I, I was happy to play a, a small part in it, but people like you and Tori and, and you know, all these leaders really did the, the hard work. Um, I mean. It, what was interesting about this is my kids watched me do this. I didn't realize how much they were, they were digesting. Like they learned, they, they knew a ton about the Taliban, a ton about Afghanistan, a ton about the plight of women and girls. They were drawing pictures of like kids in strollers in Albania. Um, and so I brought them to, to uh, Albania uh, about three weeks ago and they got to meet um, uh, this group of Afghans that they really felt they had a connection to and bring them their toys. And that, I, I don't know that there'll ever be a more meaningful um, interaction that I've borne witness to than, than, than being able to bring two of my girls to, to um, meet this incredible and, and brave group of people. Um, okay, well, uh, we have also with us uh, a young woman, an Afghan woman, who was a co-conductor uh, of the Afghanistan Orchestra. Her name is Zarifa Adiba, and I'd like to call out Zarifa uh, to the stage. So, uh, Zarifa, I mean, you're a student in, in Kazakhstan studying at the American University of Central Asia when, when Kabul fell. I mean, looking at the experience of, of so many of your friends and family trying to escape that country, what was going through your mind as you watched that? Uh, it, was, it was just a s very sad question to start by. It's so nice to see so many empowered and successful <laughs> women all together <laughs> under one roof. It's just phenomenal. Tori, thank you so much for bringing us all together tonight. Uh, back to your question. Um, it was, I, I cannot really explain till today because my four younger siblings and my mom were in Afghanistan and I was studying at the American University in Kyrgyzstan. And, uh, I remember that for a month I didn't sleep well. I, didn't, I was sleeping for one hour only and then I was just trying so hard to get them out because uh, that was, I cannot explain how that one month went by. Um, a lot of things were going on in my mind. Uh, I had been studying uh, at the American University for three years. I was just graduating in another year. I had plans, goals, dreams uh, for my country to go back and to work there and to build a future, all those goals, all those dreams shattered, like a lot of lives destroyed. And, and I found myself in a place where I didn't know how to think except saving my family. And uh, I didn't find like the way that how, how I'm gonna get out of it now. And to be honest, till today I'm here. Uh, I never wanted to become a refugee for the second time, but today I'm, standing before you in the United States as a refugee once again, I'm still trying to find my way that, okay, how am I going to fulfill those dreams that I have been dreaming for my country? 
So it is so hard to put out into words how uh, I was feeling in those uh, few days or f few weeks uh, at the beginning. You were a conductor in the Zora Orchestra. Music is, is a part of who you are and part of your life. But music is now virtually banned in Afghanistan by the Taliban. When you see these major reversals uh, of, of basic rights of the Afghan women and girls, I mean, you're out and, and, and so many others are, uh, remain in the country. Are you in touch with, with others who, who are stuck there and, and what is life like for them? Uh, as earlier, Yaldo John mentioned that it has been 270 days that girls have not been allowed to go to school. And uh, I have always believed and still believe that nothing is possible without education. And the very primary basic right of girls are, 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 are like are closed, like they are not allowed to go to school, right? Uh, I think that Afghanistan can be the, first, the only nation where girls are not allowed to go to school. We are living in 21st century. Uh, to be honest, in the past few months that I have been thinking about Afghanistan, thinking about the situation in Afghanistan, thinking about the girls in Afghanistan, um, I had a lot of questions in my mind because girls are not going to school. Just, like, girls are not going to school. Like, let's think about it, right? And around the world, we have human rights activists, we have feminists, we have girls' education advocates. Nobody is talking about it. Our Afghan sisters are not allowed to go to school. Just this is so big that we have to pay a lot of attention to it. But no one is talking to about, about it. Um, I, I mean, like, there's a lot of things that are happening, Yaldo. Like, uh, uh, you, you asked me that, how is life there? Whenever I'm talking to my nieces, whenever I'm talking to my friends who are musicians, they all are saying that, what should we do, Zarifa? And I'm here, very helpless. I, I, I can't do anything just to listen to them and to talk to you all and tell you to be the voice of those girls who are not allowed to speak today. We, we, we have uh, just a few seconds to go, but um, would you like to tell the audience what you're now doing in the United States and in your new home? I'm from one of the very few lucky refugees. I, got, uh, I, I was welcomed uh, by uh, a phenomenal team, Phantom of the Opera, and uh, my very good friends, Sammy and Safi, they helped me and welcomed me in the United States. I'm going to work with the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> <Yay>! <laughs> Uh, but my hope, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to work through my music, through every platform that I will be given. I will talk um, not just as Zarifa Adiba, but as a girl from Afghanistan and uh, for my fellow Afghans uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, I just hope and pray, I'm a very hopeful person all the time, mm -hmm. I just hope and pray from the bottom of my heart for a day where uh, every woman and men uh, will stand uh, shoulder to shoulder, side by side, uh, and work for a better uh, Afghanistan and the world, actually. Uh, I hope that, I hope for the day when every girl uh, will be allowed to go to school and, and, and and I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm ho I, I, I hope that this ambition will be, like, will come true, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank Zarifa, you. And, and thank you, Jared.